So welcome back from lunch. I know uh, this is the time of the day where we fight the Z monster and we'll try to make this panel as interesting and engaging as possible. So this, uh, this segment is a topic very close to my heart because uh, I work at Google and uh, the last two years was spent bringing digital literacy education to many communities in APAC. Now, so um, we'll, we'll go right into it. Um, I think the last day and a half has been a lot of talk about what the old museum and what the new museum is like and how the transformation will take place. And um, part of it is, as we talk about these technologies, we kind of get kind of uh, enthralled by them. What new things can we use? What, what cool tools can we do for storytelling? And this, I think this segment is really essential for us to come back to the basics of it, to, to think about the many communities out there who might not be as privileged as we are, who might not have access to super fast broadband or, or mobile internet, you know, and what do we, what should we do for them? How can we serve them in the best way possible? So without further ado, I mean, uh, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Jenny. So Jenny heads up the IMDA's uh, Digital Inclusion Program, and uh, she'll tell us about what the government is planning for to, to bring the elderly into the digital space. Can we have a round of applause? Good afternoon. Hi. Very happy to be here. Okay, so before I actually start, I think, uh, you know, Lucien mentioned about IMDA. I'm not sure how many of you actually know what IMDA is. It stands for Infocom Media Development Authority. So um, I brought actually a video to kind of introduce the organization. We were just formed. It's uh, We were formed on, in October this year. And it's actually... Um, I guess behind the backdrop of this uh, formation of IMDA is actually the convergence of technology. So what we did was we actually brought two organizations together. As the, previously was the IDA, Infocom Development Authority, and now the MDA, which is, uh, I mean, or rather previously the MDA, which is the Media Development Authority. So given the convergence, actually, you know, IMDA was formed. And I think, hence, I think all the more the need for some of the things that we are doing at Digital Inclusion Team. And uh, I thought it would be good to just introduce the um, organization that I'm, I'm from. Okay, so with that, uh, just uh, enjoy the video. But I think it basically captures what I do uh, at IMDA. Um, we believe that technology is about empowerment. And um, with that, actually, we, in 2015, we launched actually the Infocom Media Master Plan 2025. And these are things that kind of guide what we do in the different divisions in IMDA. Um, so here, the mission actually talks a little bit about um, the master plan wanting uh, to empower people to live meaningful and fulfilling lives enabled by technology and offering um, basically exciting opportunities for all, all right? And there are three focus areas. So basically, we look at the first one here, which talks about harnessing data um, for 
economic com competitiveness. So that's one of the threats that we have uh, under the master plan. And the second one is actually about nurturing the Infocom media ecosystem that encourages risk taking and continuous experimentation to create a Singapore made content products and services. So that's very much what we do as well. For me, um, which is from the personal, the digital, the digital inclusion team, um, it's not responding. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So for for me, uh, it actually comes under the third thrust, which is actually about connecting people through uh, Infocom Media, so that we can enhance the lives of the people. Right. So that's basically the master plan, and um, we're actually in the process of implementing uh, the master plan. I brought actually with me um, some data points uh, to share with all of you. So we've been doing digital inclusion for quite a bit, and uh, this is basically a reflection of where we are at the moment. Um, I think that it's a bit small, I'm not sure whether you can see it, but the first chart actually talks about household access to the internet. So we're looking at actually, the, we measure the number of households that actually have access uh, to uh, the internet. And currently we're actually at 88%, not too bad, right? And the second chart uh, on the right, over here, um, it's actually about the household's access uh, to broadband. So as you can see, the number's actually almost the same, right? It's 88%. So I, I think we can largely say that actually all the households that are accessing internet are actually using the broadband uh, infrastructure that we have put in place. The third chart over here is actually about access to computers. And uh, the, the red one, the red one actually uh, shows the adoption, meaning that the households would have one computers, versus um, the blue uh, line, which talks about actually households having two computers within the homes, two or more. And the green one is the one where we're trying to see how we could actually bring some of these devices to the households through our different programs, which I'll be sharing a little bit later. So that's, uh, we are at 87% at the moment, very close to the broadband uh, penetration rate as well. And the final chart that I brought with me today is actually the uh, smartphone penetration in Singapore. So we are at 149%, right? Meaning, you know, for each uh, one of us uh, here, actually we have about one and a half uh, smartphones that we own. So as you can see, it's actually quite high and um, if you actually compare to some of the countries in the region, um, for Hong Kong, we're looking at about 200%, and Korea is about 111%. So we're not too far away from Hong Kong, for example. So I think what this, um, these data tells us is that actually um, we are you know, doing okay, I think, in this space, right? So a lot of us are actually going on board. I think we are looking at um, at least uh, one in 10, um, or rather nine in 10 of us actually on the digital bandwagon. The other thing that um, you know, we thought uh, would be interesting is actually the um, potential for mobile um, kind of adoption and usage is actually very, very high because you know, so many of us actually have mobile devices. So that's where we look at how to um, bring or benefits you know, of technology through the mobile, mobile devices. So that's one of the things that we'll be looking at in the content and the curriculum that we, we have for the people um, here. So for the remaining you know, uh, individuals who are not on board, um, these were some of the reasons that came out from our survey as to why they are not on board. So the first chart talks about the internet. Why are they not on the internet? And it's quite alarming because, I mean, for many of us here, to us, the internet, we, we can't do without it, right? I mean, you can't imagine a day without being connected. But for those who are not on board, the 12% who are not on board, um, to them, they, they think there is no need for it. So that's the main reason at 65%. And for the computer, um, it's a different, uh, different reason. It's uh, about skills, so they felt that that's the greatest barrier for them going on to, to use a computer. All right, so that's, we thought that was interesting as well because it shows that really it's about 
understanding um, what technology can do for you, understanding and being aware of the benefits. And I think that's one of the greatest barriers that why people are not coming on board. Of course, there's this uh, thing of fear and all that that's also stopping a lot of uh, individuals for, from embracing technology. So today, I think um, you know the topic is about um, the possibility of a digital disruptions, and we talk about digital disruptions quite a bit in the industry. And when we think of digital disruptions, um, we can see so many around us, right? I mean, for us, uh, of course, we started off with communications in the areas in the space of communications, where really, you know, the the letters, the, the traditional letters and and postcards, uh, we no longer use that anymore. And then, of course, today we we look at um, the retail space. I think the the, the real estate um, uh, developers and, and property owners are really struggling with the retail space because online shopping and retail has, in a way, such, <coughs> excuse me, such so much that um, yes, it's um, you know we're really looking at the the space and you know it, within such a physical brick and mortar shops. Then of course we have the transport, the, the Ubers and all that is coming in and we're all grappling with it. And I'm sure in, in the cultural space as well, I think we will face that digital disruption and um, things will change. Um, I think it's not a question of whether it will, but really when and how it will change. So I think that's where um, um, you know my team comes in to prepare and to make sure that no one's left behind, that everyone is able to to embrace technology to benefit them, their lives and to improve uh, the quality of their lives. So with that, um, we have crafted some our programs around uh, four areas. The first is actually about ensuring that uh, the people have greater accessibility um, to these infrastructure. So with that, we actually look at financial assistance to help the uh, low-income households. We look at the uh, persons with disabilities, or PWDs we call it, and to see how to increase the adoption of assistive technologies. And uh, we also look at the connectivity in the public spaces, and we have some of the wi wireless connectivity in public areas uh, to ensure that it Everyone has accessibility to the internet, to broadband, and to the services that are online. Um, the second area that we think is very important is actually uh, about raising awareness. So about communications, communicating the benefits of technologies. We are looking at actually building this pool of advocates, especially within the different communities that we reach out to, and uh, to share the benefits. The third that we actually, uh, the third area that we're looking at is actually about equipping skills. So a lot of our programs are actually geared towards um, building that capabilities. Uh, I think both at the individual levels as well as at the organization level, um, especially the organizations that work with these communities that are in the vulnerable segments. And the last area that we are looking at is actually um, promotion of innovation um, in this space and to help to see how we can help more um, individuals, more Singaporeans embrace technologies in their lives. So um, this is um, you know, some of the strategies that we have within the Digital Inclusion uh, Initiative. And I'm gonna go into the specific programs that we roll out um, and how it ties back to the strategies. The first one that I'm going to share about is actually the new PC Plus program. Um, we've been running this program since 1999, right? Because we saw the need to ensure that the students uh, have um, have access to technology, uh, given that education in schools are just evolving uh, so much, uh, you know. And any any student that does not have access to these. Uh, uh, devices uh, would be in a way disadvantaged and we didn't want that. So this program actually equips uh, needy students and persons with disabilities um, with a computer and uh, broadband. So the computers are actually provided um, at a subsidized rate up to about 75% and uh, they actually get three years of free broadband um, during that period. 
And if they continue to be students and they continue to qualify, um, they can actually renew uh, the subsidy with, uh, with IMDA. The other thing that we do, other than for the individuals, actually we work with the schools a lot uh, to look at how uh, to provide their students with some of these uh, devices as well. So that's a part of the new PC Plus program. And finally, uh, under this program, we have what we call the Inspire Fund. These are for uh, students who are not even able to pay the last mile of the subsidy. So um, what we do is we get them to um, do community work and then uh, they will actually get the entire computer, the desktop or the laptop for free together with the broadband. So this is one of the programs that we do to help uh, students from uh, low-income families to get connected. The second is also about accessibility. Um, we have this thing called the Home Access Program. Again, it's uh, targeted at the low-income families, but these are the households outside of uh, the student uh, group. Um, so be it the very old or the very young, um, they actually also can enjoy that broadband connectivity. However, the specifications, the technical specs of the devices are a little bit different uh, from the students because it's really based on the needs. So for this one, um, for low-income families that qualify, they actually get um, fiber broadband to their homes at $6, and they also get a free tablet that comes with it for them to get connected. And uh, this year, we actually announced that we are also supplementing it with uh, what we call support training programs, where um, it's not just about giving them the devices, the hardware, but we are also ensuring that they uh, have the skills to, to embrace technology. So for this one, we're also working with NCSS and some of the other uh, VWOs to make sure that uh, you know, this, uh, there's effective use of the devices. So in the area of accessibility, we also have uh, wireless at SG. I think some of you may be familiar. So um, the team uh, at IMDA working on this wireless at SG has um, actually ramped up the number of accessibility points. So today, we actually have 2 million active users. Um, uh, and we have about 10,000 Wi-Fi hotspots across, across Singapore. And the intent is actually to double the number of hotspots to about 20,000 in the upcoming year. So we're doing a lot as well to make sure that those who do not have broadband access at home or in school can actually go to a public place and have accessibility. So this is another thing that we are doing at IMDA to uh, make sure that everyone is included on this uh, digital bandwagon. Not sure if uh, any of you are familiar with this, but this is actually the Digital TV Assistance Scheme. As you know, um, we will be migrating from the analog TV to a digital TV. And um, with that, it means that those of us who do not have cable TV at home uh, will need to buy a setup box. So to help the low-income families to ensure that they still continue to receive and to enjoy media, um, we actually have uh, provide free setup boxes for them to connect to their existing analog TV so that they can also have access to the free-to-air um, TV programs. All right, so this is another program that we have. The next program is actually what we call the Enable IT uh, program, uh, which is about empowering the persons with disabilities. So under this uh, program, we have three different thrusts. One is actually about education and awareness on the benefits of assistive technology, um, because we think that there's still there's really not enough um, understanding of what's out there. Uh, so this is something that we do. And um, we have actually this year, just earlier this year, we did an inaugural forum, something similar to the, you know something like this. Um, it's called the E-Square Connect. And it was held in July to raise really the awareness of assistive technology in this area. Second is actually working with a disability volunteer uh, welfare organizations uh, to train and to um, you know help their clients to adopt the technology. So some of them are equipped with some of these technologies so that their clients can actually enjoy them as well. And finally, um, one of our big projects is actually with TechAble in the enabling village that was launched by our PM. And um, this um, multi-party collaboration 
acts as a resource uh, center for the target group, as well as for them to receive training for independent living. The next program that we have is actually the Silver Infocom Junctions and Curriculum. So the seniors um, is, is a target group that we, we think we need to put in a bit more resource to get them uh, to enjoy technology. So what we have done is we've actually set up these training centers, uh, training hubs um, for seniors, and they are highly subsidized, they are uh, very low cost, and um, there are about 30 centers at the moment, and we actually provide the equipment the curriculum for these seniors as well to learn simple, you know, how to set up your, your tablets, how to, you know, go on to what's, what's computers and all that, to understand what's internet. So really, really basic fundamental kind of training offered at the Silver Infocom Junctions. And to raise the awareness on this for the silver population, we actually have what we call the Silver IT Fest. And so it's, it's a festival and uh, basically reaching out to the seniors, helping them to understand the benefits of technologies where we actually showcase uh, the latest technologies and we have mini workshops for them to have appreciation of what internet is about, for example. We also engage um, volunteers from the community to help us uh, in this course. And uh, we actually launched this thing called the Friends of Silver Infocom. Uh, we currently have about 300 uh, adults and uh, student volunteers. In fact, many of the volunteers are actually seniors themselves, which is really great because it's a great testimony uh, to those that they're reaching out to. And what, is in, uh, what was interesting was that we actually had great support from the corporates as well. Um, so for example, Microsoft, Dell, you know, IBM, they're all on board with us as corporate volunteers when we do these outreach to the seniors. And this is the uh, Silver Infocom Wellness Ambassadors. So every year we will appoint um, seniors that are really savvy, that are actually out there volunteering, helping other seniors to come on board. So we actually have built up quite a big poll of uh, volunteer advocates. Uh, these are our ambassadors. We have 132 CWAS at the moment. And finally, I know time is like up, uh, this is the social innovation grant. So um, I think besides just doing the outreach and the training, I think it's important that we also um, invite these organizations uh, with the stakeholders to look at innovative ways to reach out to their clients and to get them on board. So for those of you, know, you may be able to qualify for this, and if you want to um, apply for a grant, uh, that's also possible. So we're looking at how um, you know, we're trying to look at piloting projects using innovative uh, IT solutions. So I think with that, um, I brought another video to kind of sum up some of the things that we're doing and to talk a little bit about the benefits of technology. And with that, actually, I end my presentation. Thank you so much. I uh, yeah, tell you, uh, now Singapore is going to, be going to be a smart city. You don't know smartphone, you very difficult to survive, you know. send photographs to the children and at the same time see the photographs that the children put up in Facebook. Next year, April, they're not using 2G anymore. So I want to learn 3G or 4G handphone. New apps coming out every day, almost daily. Um, this helps help us to better our lives, make our lives more convenient. My dad recently got the transport app. He can find out the bus timings and like the directions and all that kind of thing. So it made life more easy for him to travel around. Initially, I find it quite difficult like, because for myself, I'm very poor in my IT, I'm uh, very slow in catching up. But with the help of all the volunteers, eventually I got it. And it takes a bit of time. It takes a bit of time. We need to get used to it. When you grow old, you learn also. Thank you very much, Jenny. Now, next speaker is uh, Jean. Uh, I met Jean first time, I think it was a uh, Singapore Memory Project. And back then, uh, he was in charge of curating all the memories for Singapore's 50th anniversary. Uh, and, and then now, he's, he's been working on the future, um, 
the future of us exhibition. You know, and, and I mean, when, when I looked at it, he kind of curates all of our collective memories and then all of our collective hopes. So, I mean, let us invite our, I think, resident storyteller, uh, Jean, please. Uh, could you? State of the Art Exhibition to cap off Singapore's Golden Jubilee. The Future of Us Exhibition is one that looks at the possibilities of the future for Singapore. Combining award-winning design. We try to do something that really has never been done before. With immersive multi-sensory experience. I think the future is going to be very exciting. See how it all comes together in creating the future of us. Wednesday, 9.30pm on Channel News Asia. Creating the Future of Us is presented by the Future of Us exhibition in partnership with the Ministry of Communications and Information. Hi, I think I need my clicker. Is there a clicker somewhere? Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, how's everyone doing? Yeah, I'd like to ask how you are. Because, you know, every time I do a presentation, I have a mortal fear of really sucking. And um, so to avoid sucking badly, I need to make the scariest person in the room a little happier. Yeah, and there are a lot of candidates today. You guys have no idea how scary you look. Yeah, especially this elevation thing. You can see every single face. Yeah, including those who didn't pay for this uh, conference. Sit, sit at the back. So, um, I, I believe the scariest person in the room is over here. Yeah. Oh gosh, she's still scary. <laughs> Hi ma'am, how are you? Yeah, you prostrate yourself. Yeah, worship the local god and then give her a present. This is a notebook from the future of us. It can't be bought anywhere anymore. Yeah, but not enough people bought it, that's why I have a lot of it. <laughs> okay, hi, how's everybody? Oh, okay, okay, so, okay, so if, I, if I suck after this, you'll forgive me? Will you forgive me? You're the most colorful person in the room. Hi. Hi, how are you? Okay, so let's get to it. I changed my presentation about an hour before coming here and I made the NHU people panic because I gave it to them two, two weeks ago, a week or two ago. And the reason I did that because I was flipping through back issues the New York Times. I know that's supposed to make me sound very smart. But New York Times got it wrong. Trump won. So they suck. Uh, so I was just flipping through the back issues and I, I suddenly saw an article on Alfred Hitchcock and his new, uh, the new biography. So I thought I should change it because of that. And if you get to the end of this presentation without falling asleep or looking at your tablet, Katsyang, okay, can I get everyone, please don't look at your devices. Can we go non-digital? Let's go analog for just a while. Hi, Diana. And just look at me, okay? I'm pure physical, nothing digital. Can we do that? Okay, at the end, I'll tell you what it's all about. But this, this is a presentation of aspirations. I, I failed to achieve what I wanted to do at The Future of Us. And I'll tell you what I would, like to, I would have liked to do, and hopefully my next project, which will be coming up in a few years, it will come true. Okay, so this is like a prelude. It's like Rogue One, you know, it's the prelude to the real Star Wars. Okay, let's, let's, let's go through it. So, um, when I took the project, it was the scariest project of my life because I had very little time and I was supposed to come up with an exhibition to tell the story of Singapore in 2030. Uh, the only thing I was given was that the future is not inevitable. Yeah, the future has not happened yet, so anything could happen. So you know the first thing I thought, I think you look, you look wonderful. I just want to say that. I saw you the minute you came in and I thought, you look like you come out of the pages of Vogue. <laughs> yeah, okay. She just said, so do you. Can you say that again? <laughs> so do you, G. <laughs> okay, sorry. I have to get on. Okay, I have what? Five minutes? Okay, so anyway, the future of us, when I thought about it in that line, I thought of this, the Terminator. <laughs> because Sarah Connor said that uh, in the middle of the, the Terminator, I think it was Terminator 2, the future is not set. But every future in the Terminator was dystopian, and including the last one. So every single day you've seen, it comes with a very bad ending. So I thought, okay, let me just take that line, the future is not set. And if you have noticed, those of you who have actually been to the exhibition, the future is not set, it's actually the tagline. Yeah, so Lipson, I stole it from the Terminator. 
Yeah, but none of the ministers know that because they don't watch movies. Okay, so um, <laughs> very, I'm sorry. It's like copyright and all, but you know, it's such a great line. So the future is not set as a theme, and I thought, but what if we don't make it dystopian? What if it's about choices, about the things that you have to make? And also, what if it's something that makes everyone feel special? A lot of future exhibitions that I go to, a lot of these shows I go to, especially those in convention centers. Hi, Cheryl. You know what they do to you? They make you feel miserable. And a lot of the older people who go, you know what they tell me? Your cardigan looks like my jacket. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. Can we just like, just have a look? I will keep to my time, Fangam. Come, come, come. Come, come, let, let's show people what it looks like, yeah. Her cardigan looks like, yeah, it looks like my jacket, don't you think? Yeah, take a picture. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so anyway, where was I? Yes, and you go to convent listening, very good. Gorgeous and listening. Okay, so when, when you go to convention centers and future exhibitions, you just see booth after booth. And if you're one of the older people, most of them tell me that they feel they will not live to see it because it's too distant. Yeah, so I'm hitting the theme right now, which is digital inclusion, right? Yeah, it's not going to appear in any of my charts, but I will get to the theme. So we thought, okay, with these two challenges, what are we going to do? I, I think in movies. So as I was creating The Future of Us, I thought of movies. So I said, why don't I, I, I use this as an opportunity, use government money, uh, never tell PM about this, but use all of that money to do a tribute to movies. Yeah, but hide it so that I don't get fired. So as I did this, I thought, which is the movie that to me has left a very lasting impression on pop culture? Because movies is the way to connect. I know we're talking about digital inclusion and you know, getting people in. I think movies are the best way. So when I thought about it, I thought of this, The Wizard of Oz. You guys know what city this is? Harry Potter. <laughs> oh my God. Deanna, you're from the National Library. <laughs> no, but anyway, you know what? Um, the idea of this was to intimate something that has had such influence through time. And I thought of The Wizard of Oz. By the way, you're not wrong, because this was done in 1939, the year of Gone with the Wind. Yeah, it, it was an excellent year, 1930. You guys should look it up. Uh, 1939 is a vintage year for movies. Yeah, it had, it had this, it had... What does it have? It had, uh, oh, it had Dark Victory, Betty Davis. It had Ninocta, Greta Garbo. You know, it was an excellent year. So I thought this is the best way to do it. I know you're looking at the reflection, you're forgiven. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I can see if you're using your devices, by the way. <laughs> okay, so with The Wizard of Oz, I thought, okay, let's create a city that when you walk in, it makes you want to go in. And then we created something called The Home Tomorrow. So we thought of the exhibition as a movie set. So no matter who you are, what your age group, when you walk in, you understand it. You don't need panels to tell you the story of what the future looks like. So we created a movie set where, honestly, I think they reach out to the heavens in a way that was in a scene from Wizard of Oz. Do you guys remember the scene where it turned from black, uh, from sapphire black and white to color? and the tornado, and remember the tornadoes going all the way up to the sky? This was inspired by that. But obviously you couldn't say that the future is a tornado. Yeah, or you know, government will fire me, I'll never get a project again. So we created that, and then we thought, but you see, the thing about Wizard of Oz was that when Dorothy was in Wizard of Oz, the only way that she could have survived the trip and got to what she wanted was because she had friends, she had guys. And you guys know who the guides are? You guys only know Harry Potter, right? <laughs> At the end, I'll, I'll forgive you if you tell me one. Tin Man. The Tin Man, the Scarecrow, and the Lion. So she had guides. So we thought, okay, this is all going to do. We have 15,000 dreams that we had to curate. 152 organizations breathing around my neck. I had to pull that into something that's comprehensible. And no matter what we did, it just wasn't comprehensible to people. So we needed guides. So we created the idea of 
of a hosted visit of guys. Okay, I know this sounds very, very low tech and all that, but we had teams of people coming in, and the teams are like human signages. So if you go to the exhibition and notice that there are very few signages, there are very few signage, sorry, there are very few text panels. Uh, most of it is explained by someone. And the reason we did that was that we wanted people to feel that every visit is like a visit to your home. And that's why we call it Home Tomorrow. And for each of the people who were there, they are part of a team, just like Dorothy. Yeah, they're part of a team. They're like guides, guides to whatever text panels there are. So the guys, they are a team because they come as a team. I know this is going to be very difficult because, you know, volunteers, they come on their own. But these volunteers, they come as a group. So an organization would send a team of people who already work together. So they care a lot about each other. So one person would know that the other person needs his medication at some time. Another person would know that this person likes what for breakfast. And that's what they do together. So every week, we change teams, because this was quite a huge exhibition. Every week, I had to induct a new family of volunteers. I had to train each of them, and I tell them, this is like your home. You're going to bring someone into your home. You're going to make them feel that they are special. So I, I always tell them, as long as you make one person feel special, how are you? Where are you from? How are you? Holland. Holland. Oh, best place in the world. Yeah, Amsterdam. Oh, I love the library there. It's beautiful. The open bar is, is one of the most beautiful libraries in the world. Yeah, the library at Orchard looks a bit like it. Yeah, <laughs> I guess you should look that up. No, it's true. It's, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. So anyway, to make one person feel special, to make them feel that they have a place in the future, I told them that's your job. And we also told them that you have to make this a social experience. It's not an information experience. So I know that some of them come and think, you know, I'm like a high-class museum guy. You know, I'm here to tell you about the intricacies of this particular experience. I said, no, you're here to help them take pictures. You're here to make them laugh, tell a few jokes, you know, and walk around, uh, shake their hand, make them feel like they are the most welcome in this space. So that was the job. So the whole social experience, the exhibition experience as a conversation, was something that was very important to us. And some of them started to switch gears because they work as a team. So when we had people coming in from, um, say, the, uh, some seniors coming in, they, they actually switched languages. So that we had Cantonese, uh, Cantonese guys. They switched to Cantonese, and then we had guys who actually switched to Bahasa. So they kept doing that switching, so it was quite intricate. But because it was a team, and they were able to move around, everyone knew each other's position. So I just felt that was quite beautiful, it was unplanned. But it made the exhibition something that people remember as human. And as a result, it made the future exhibition something that people remember as human as well. Okay, this is the, oh, this is really dark. Okay, this is the reason I changed my presentation. You guys want to hear about Hitchcock? Okay, I have, I have two other presents. Lucian, I have time, so I'm fine. I have two other presents. I'll tell you what they are for, okay? Because we come to the middle of the presentation, right? It's at like the middle of lunch. You're not sure whether you want it to finish or you want to start again because you hate your lunch partner. So what I do have to, so that you guys will love me, is that I have another of, one of these oversupply uh, notebooks that we couldn't sell from the future of us. And then just for December, it, it's, not, it's not the best book in the world, I've read better, but it is such a breezy read. Have you guys seen this? It's called The Birth of Korean Cool, How One Nation is Conquering the World Through Pop Culture. It's an excellent book. Do you love it? Yeah, yeah, The, the, the Red Princess, you love it? Yeah, okay, so if you, if you love this book, this is what I ask you to do. Uh, pay attention look enthusiastic, and I always say if you can't look enthusiastic, then fake looking enthusiastic, okay? So the person who is the most enthusiastic at the end of my presentation gets this book. Yeah, that's like second prize, and no one wants to be second, huh? <laughs> okay, okay, let's get back. So where was I? It looks much better here, Lucian. Yeah, it looks a lot better here than there. Okay, so anyway, Alfred Hitchcock. So I was yeah, okay. I, was, what, I was reading it and I thought, we had about 15,000 dreams that we had to curate. So right at the start, we said, this is going to be an incomplete future. And I don't care if I never work again. I tell you, I tell you why, because I had 152 organizations who were my partners. 
and all of them represent every aspect of the public, private, and uh, people sectors. So if I offend all of them, I will never work again. But then I thought, screw it. Because if I were to put 152 organizations into the presentation, then uh, people would just die. You know? So instead, we had to be very selective to pull that all together into 250 scenes that were presented. So they're presented as scenes, not as this is a housing development board, public housing plans of the future, none of that. So we integrated into the scene and I thought how best to show it. One way to show it is to show videos. You know, you show videos all over. So you walk in, you get a sea of videos, then you maybe see one or two. And were you here before? <laughs> it just came, right? Okay, so I didn't hallucinate. Yeah. <laughs> how are you, I'm Jean? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens when you get nerves, yeah. So, so where was I again? Uh, same. Oh, same. Okay, so different scenes in the... Um, in the universe. Okay, how to present it. So I, I was determined not to do videos. You know, when you do like a video, people just die. And yet at the same time, I didn't want to do one of those, what do you call it? Uh? You, you put all these fake figures in, in like a box. What do you call it? Oh, diorama. Yeah, that's what one minister told me. And I almost threw up. Um, so <laughs> I won't tell you who it is, but it's one of the five. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll tell you about it later, our foreign friends. So one of the five said diorama, I said, diorama? I'm not going to do that. You know why? Because it's very dead, yeah, and it's not believable. But yet I wanted to do digital inclusion. Okay, see, I just hit the theme again. So in order to have digital inclusion, we created a, a, a scene where the backdrop of the scene is actually made out of real diorama, like furniture and all that. Uh, and then in front of it, we would have a very high-tech digital screen. But if you don't know better, you think you're seeing a little bit of magic. And that actually came. And I don't tell anyone that because it's too scary. I don't tell the press, but the inspiration for that actually came from Rear Window. And you guys know that's a very bad reference because that's like being a voyeur and being a pervert. Uh, <laughs> but Jimmy Stewart, who was, who was staring at everybody, actually did something good. So from that scene, I thought, what if it is like the rear window? What the exhibition, besides having this great movie set like Wizard of Oz, was also a little bit like rear window. Then I don't have to think. I don't have to think, am I digital or am I, am I not? Do I have access to the computer or not? I don't care. Because when I come to the exhibition, I don't care. There are, there's no entry criteria for understanding. This is kind of what it looks like. I'm sorry, I just did this morning. Couldn't get a good picture. But the idea was to have an LED screen and we shot all of these scenes against the green screen, we remove all the backdrop, and then we build real props behind it. So when you see, you get a sense of the real, the digital, as well as the analog. And this is what some people said. This is a wonderful uh, series that we did for uh, special needs kids. And then this is the one I really like. There were these two girls, they came at the end of the exhibition, not at the start, and they told me that and I thought it was the best thing that anyone said. I love accolades. Dolores, where are you? You'll know that in my previous version, I had like five, six accolades, right? Including from DPM Theo. So I took them all out, because I thought this is the best, yeah. And this particular one was the best because I thought it was the most mature, and I started to think about it. Technology that brings people together, and one way to do it is to make it disappear. This is the results of the exhibition, and uh, I have to tell you, when I did the preview, I wanted to die. I did the preview about uh, two weeks before that. And when the results came in, you know, we did poll figures, when the results came in, it was a complete disaster. There were people who actually hated the exhibition. They said, I don't understand any of this. Oh, God, I thought that's it. That's the end of my career. I'll never work again. Yeah, I don't know where I'm going to go. Huh, Lipsin? Do you have a new job? You do, right? I notice. Okay, so I. That's, that's the problem being my Facebook friend. I stalk you before any presentation. So when we did this, it was so bad that we had to rethink. And then someone told me something. He did a tour for the elderly. And because it's the elderly, you know what he did? He summoned a group of the little uh, 
I was going to say minions. Yeah, okay, I can't think of another word, minions. So the minions started hosting them. It became something like a social experience. And that particular focus group charted the highest scores. And that's when we started to do this. And at the end of the exhibition, this is a summary of the whole, we actually hit 95% in the final weeks. That means only 5% 5 of the people hated it. Are they in the audience? <laughs> Some of you look like that 5%. So I just want to end with this line and also with these words because I was in Melbourne about three years ago. I know this is, this is done with Melbourne, right, Lucian? This conference? This conference is done with Melbourne people, right? Yeah, because I need to suck up to the right uh, city. <laughs> okay, so with Melbourne people. And then uh, I was there for a library technology conference and I was sharing on my project called the Singapore Memory Project. So when I finished the presentation, someone blocked about it and said, I think that's what Jean's saying. And I remembered that because I didn't say that. But I thought, no, not the swing part, not the swing part. I remember that because it says, small data beats big data. It was an incomplete exhibition and human scale beats web scale. So even though the exhibition had, I think, a lot of schmanzy, fancy technology, and it wasn't cheap, I tell you, uh, but everyone who went in, including the seniors, uh, felt that they were home again, except it's sometime tomorrow. Okay, I'm gonna give this away, and then when I finish, because this is not the real ending, when I finish, I bow, uh, just like give me a applause or something, because you know I need that. Yeah. Sometimes we'll give this to one of them to our foreign friends, but this is like a competition because there's so many of you. Yeah, there's so many of you, but you were the more att most attentive, so you get the prize. Thank you so much. Yeah. And this wait 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 not yet not yet. Okay, and this one. Hmm. Is someone dying for this book? Anyone? <laughs> Thank you. It just had to be the person at the end of the auditorium. I'll come to you. Okay, I've not exercised for decades. Why do you have to stay at the back? How are you, I Melissa? Really enjoyed your Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you. And she's from Esplanade. Let's give her a big round of applause. Okay. So with that, I want to say thank you and you guys made me feel that I don't suck that bad, okay? So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean. Our next speaker, we have uh, Debbie Ding. Uh, I did a quick Google on what she does because uh, I'm, not, I'm not one of those people that are really into art. But when I saw the body of work she has on the website, I'm totally amazed. Okay, she, she covers different types of technologies, tells stories from all facets of existence. You'll be, you'll be amazed at what, what she has to offer. So I think we'll look forward to a very, very uh, informative time. Give me a moment to um, log on my... Um, is, it, is it on? Oh, it's on. Hi, my name is Debbie, and um, thank you to uh, Cultural Academy for inviting me to speak. And I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak to you today. And uh, well, I've sort of uh, made my my presentation um, about uh, formats today. And but maybe to explain what I, I've done, what what I do. I'm a I'm an artist from Singapore, and I guess in the the past I've. I've, I've, well, I've done. Uh, you could call me almost like a small data, small data specialist in a sense. I've collected rocks. Um, I collect a lot of rocks. I, I collect my dreams as well. This is a. Um, I try to draw my dreams for like about eight years. Um, so all of them are drawn out uh, into into map form, and I also collect a lot of spots. So I make archives of spots on the road. Um, it, they're, they're quite a lot of them, quite a lot of spots. And I guess as an artist, I've also worked uh, with a lot of um, digital, uh, well, I, I, I was building uh, these interactives as well that were, this is actually an interactive I was building that involved a touch table that I tried to build from scratch in which you could interact with the shape of the Singapore River. And another, 
um, I guess you know, a lot of the things I've been building have um, kind of used a lot of uh, technology or the digital, or they present it in a, in a digital interactive. Uh, this was a Kinect installation in which you could also change the shape of the river by waving at it. So going through the, the shape of the river over the years and um, I guess a lot of what I've used technology in my work uh, is often to recuperate uh, kind of things that are or loss or mysteries like this island. I don't know how many of you know this island of Pulau Saigon. Have you heard of Pulau Saigon in Singapore? Singaporeans? This, uh, this is actually um, from the street directory, I think in the 60s. And this island, um, Pulau Saigon, had ceased to exist. Uh, well, today it's not there anymore. This is actually on the Singapore River. And um, I, want, I, I found out from, I found uh, the archeologists and amateur archeologists who had been uh, digging up the site uh, Pulau Saigon, and um, he had actually uh, found all these. He had actually uh, alerted the university about the the site when he thought he saw some Neolithic wares in the in the river. And uh, this is the um, this is the report from um, the uh, archaeologists from the university, and they, they they conducted a very quick dig on this on this site. And there were lots of things that were kind of unresolved since it was such a quick uh, archaeological dig. It was done, I think, over just a few weeks uh, in pieces. And um, there were lots of mysterious things which um, Mr. Ko Lien Huat, who was an uh, amateur archeologist, uh, was studying. And he looked at all these mysterious pieces of metal that he ended up drawing over and over again. But he didn't really know what they, they were. But it's uh, really interesting how he actually just rota rotated them around, kept drawing them out. And I wanted to kind of use, I wondered if I could use, since all the things I've been doing are uh, with technology. I wanted to see if I could actually take these um, objects that were listed in the dig that were kind of really mundane but also unidentifiable. These, a lot of these things when they were written in the list they had like a big question mark like they didn't know is it, is it a knife? Is it a, you know, is it, uh, what kind of uh, pin is it? You know, they, or is it, is it actually a slate? Uh, and what's a slate used for? So there were lots of mysteries as to what the objects looked like. And I wondered if I could task a machine with um, kind, of re kind of resurrecting these objects, you know, like in the way um, today, this is an example of Google's um, neural networks, which are uh, detecting what uh, it's both classifying as well as uh, uh, detecting the objects within the picture. And, and to do it the other way around, to find outlines of objects. Uh, let's say, um, if you can you detect what a, a monitor is? What is a monitor in essence? What is the essence of a thing? So um, in the end, what I ended up doing is tasking, uh, kind of, well, writing a script that would kind of generate these objects uh, based on only its title, like say uh, a fork, if you only, uh, or a spoon, you know? What is a spoon today? You know, uh, if you looked on Google Images, what do all the spoons look like? What is the most generic spoon, you know? An existence and uh, to kind of use the machine to kind of produce uh, uh, this idea of what the spoon looks like. So these are and then print it into into reality as well. So um, and and this is the uh, kind of the the forming a library of objects that uh, kind of attempt to I guess get towards what um, these mysterious kind of objects found at Pulau Saigon would have looked like. This is a. So in, in a way, other things that I'm kind of interested in are also this kind of uh, almost misunderstandings or loss in the, or this kind of digital artifacts that you get in the process of translating, say, something um, quite analog that has a, a, a kind of historical um, origin or a space and translating it into the digital. Um, like this is a, this are a number of, uh, this is what happens when you scan the room, but you get all these artifacts of uh, parts where people were not scanning the room very correctly, uh, or they were moving around while they did the scanning. So there's a lot of data loss in the whole scan. And uh, I guess the, the thing I made it into was also trying to turn that into a 3D object. And all this thing I'm telling you about, I guess is, um, you know, I, I, today's the panel is about digital divide, and I, I know that we, we often think of the digital divide as something that is uh, relating to digital accessibility. Like in this, this is actually the, the, the chart I found from IDA's website on Infocom usage, uh, which is you know looking at the how many how many people have computers at home, how many people have internet at home. And I know often we talk about how people are assessing the digital, but um, for me as an artist, I think what I'm often thinking about is actually this 
other idea also of the machine readability of something. You know, if the machine, like a process that I use is often using the machine as an extension of, my, of myself as a, as a tool to investigate uh, something um, further than what I can. And, and so if um, the machine is unable to read the data I've collected, all these archives and, and kind of information that I collect, uh, then it can't really help me with that. And I think that um, you know a lot of our kind of approaches uh, towards data are kind of centered around this uh, ability to access, to to capture, and you know, transmit large amounts of data. But um, you know, and, and a lot of things that we have are also born digital. But um, what does it mean to have data that's kind of usable? You know, um, this is a. We, I mean, we have to think of it in terms of say the human readable digital formats versus the machine readable formats. So um, things like PDFs, PowerPoints, uh, you know, Word documents, these are human readable, but they're not machine readable, even though they're digital. And as for you know, machine readable, there are things like we, you know, things that we uh, mark up so that computers can read things, but we, we can partially read them like formats like uh, HTML, you know, which we, we can read to some extent, and also machine-oriented um, kind of um, kind of markup like uh, comma-separated values, uh, XML or JSON files. So these are machine. There's a distinction between the two, and um, this is a. I think the Oxford uh, English Dictionary defines the digital as uh, data that is stored as digital signals, you know, and well the. The OED on its website also usefully writes that uh, if you if you wanted to convert all of its uh, uh, twenty volumes and twenty one thousand seven hundred and thirty pages of its dictionary into a machine readable format, uh, you would have to spend um, uh, one hundred and twenty human kind of years to type it out, and also to proofread it would take an additional sixty years to do. So you know, thinking about this conversion process. Um, I like to talk about PowerPoint because it's something that we have used, we've been using the whole whole day uh, in, in things like this conference, you know. And um, um, yeah, I, I also like to talk about the Columbia Shuttle, which, uh, you know, may not seem like it has much to do with, with PowerPoint. And um, this is a, the official picture of the crew. And the, the thing about the shuttle, the Columbia disaster, uh, was that uh, the, this the shuttle actually uh, disintegrated when it was um, on re-entry back to Earth. So during the um, January 2003 uh, uh, spaceflight of the Columbia, 82 seconds after liftoff, a 1.67 pound, which is about 760 grams, piece of foam insulation broke off from the, uh, the, tank, uh, the fuel tank and hit the left wing. And after the shuttle had orbited the Earth for two weeks without uh, noticing this, uh, this hole in its wing, um, when it re-entered, the Columbia burned up during re-entry uh, because of the term of protection that was no longer able to withstand the temperatures that occur when you re-enter into the atmosphere. And this is a picture of the, uh, the, the ramp that was the, the ramp that caused the disaster. And I think a really um, commonly quoted uh, Kind of example of visual communications is uh, Edward Tuff's um, kind of analysis of uh, this, uh, uh, this. This is, these are the slides that were used by the Boeing engineers to kind of communicate what they were doing and kind of assess the the risk of uh, all the things all the things they were they were building um, and showing it to their superiors. So this is the example of the of the slide itself. Oh, the slide, uh, as you can see, uh, the word significantly occurs many times. And uh, the the way that is indented is also it's pretty much all over the place, and um, it, the word significantly doesn't really tell you in relation to what is significantly at times, you know. And uh, the the using the word it, you know, but having to condense all the information in such a short time, short short slide, you end up not really um, kind of being able to to describe everything in detail. So um, you know, like you know, if you look at a lot of PowerPoint today, you know, it's always it will end up looking a bit like this in a way. Um, it's really hard to actually communicate using PowerPoint, you know. And I think like some of the speakers have mentioned about this pitch culture or startup culture, kind of this language of this uh, this kind of giving a presentation to people in kind of invading uh, all different kinds of technologies and other people working in other fields as well. You know, um, this is actually a quote from. Um, 
uh, the Technical Communications Journal, uh, in which they, uh, a study was conducted on students as well as uh, people who uh, working professionals from different fields. And they found that um, after doing a survey, a small survey of about 1,000 people, they thousand plus, uh, they found that 36% of the preparation time of the average proposal was consumed by design and animation work by people without formal graphics training. So I guess the point that I, I'm trying to make is that, you know, even the human readable formats do not necessarily mean that all the humans can understand or comprehend what we're talking about. And from PowerPoint, you know, looking at things like PDFs, you know, which, you know, is the main mode of which we distribute information. Even today's timetable and everything was, is always, you know, you want to make sure the format of it hasn't gone off, you know, you send it in a PDF form. But of course, at the same time, um, saving, everyone saving their files in a PDF, if you embed a table or a screenshot in it, you know, it's not really the right format for sending the data on. If it's, you want it to be machine readable later. So I guess, for me, this idea of digitization, I think of it as the creation of a completely separate or often a new digital object. And it's not necessarily just a matter of direct translation. And um, I want to talk about this, this uh, archive that I'm working on at the moment, which is actually for uh, the department that I uh, did my master's at, uh, which is Design Interactions. And it's, um, I mean, design interactions at Royal College of Art, which um, kind of spans over a different number of years. It got, comes back to also the um, interaction design over some years, and it was also called computer-related design. It began in the uh, 1990s. And I think maybe today people think of it, of all the work that it's doing is quite different from uh, most people are working in critical design or speculative design from that program. But um, of course, it began uh, in the, when the first time the course had kind of uh, was in its first incarnation, it began as a kind of computer-related design. I think you could describe it as one of the first interaction uh, design programs to be offered in the world. And of course, this is actually um, the website they had, which on, in today's form is really surprisingly tiny um, on, the, on the screen. And at the time, all the students also worked off computers already, so everything they made was kind of born digital, as it were. Um, you would imagine that you know everything, um, and I've got this hard drive full of the archive that it would be easier to work with this material, except that everything that I have down there is actually in classic environment. So it's incredibly hard to archive this uh, digital material, even as the people were working at the kind of forefront of what they were doing. You know, it's digitizing, um, kind of n not only. Um, being able to kind of archive the material uh, wasn't always at the top of people's minds when they were making those kind of works. And even like uh, myself as a flash designer some years back, um, I never thought that, of course, uh, I guess a few years would pass and then flash would be totally uh, kind of not really used by anyone today uh, or not used on your browsers anymore. And um, most things are now, standards of, of course have moved on, you know, kind of open standards like um, this uh, W3C. And this is a, a kind of, this is a, another example of a, another archive project I was working on with the, an art space called The Substation. So they had asked me to kind of, um, kind of interpret their kind of archive. Uh, they are independent, if, in case you don't know, Substation is an is a independent space that is on Armenian Street, quite near, in fact, it's just over, uh, it's, it, it's just around the corner. And uh, they had uh, reached the uh, grand old age of 25, which is a, was a big deal for a Singaporean space. And they asked me to kind of uh, look at their archive, uh, which uh, well, included a lot of missing missing things. Here, this is the uh, like all their albums look like this basically. Like someone borrowed the photo, Teenage Magazine borrowed the photo in the 90s and never returned it. So um, they had a lot of problems with their archive. And furthermore, we were talking about digitizing all the photographs they had kind of taken, um, except that all the photographs they, they they had looked a bit like like this. Or, or this, basically. So I couldn't actually see any faces. And they didn't have, it took a long time to even match the title to each uh, thing. And we were talking, I mean, we're going to digitize it. But of course, the problem was that we didn't really know what they were, or who, you know, it wasn't even like a photo that you could, and of course, you know, when I talked to the people who took it, they would say like, oh, it was meant to capture the movement, you know, uh, more than the, you know, the face. And the camera was like, it's a compact camera. You know, that's how they archived it with the kind of, um, resources they had at the time. So, you know, things like, you know, um, I was thinking of running, so I ran the pictures in as well uh, through an, um, uh, a kind of set 
to see what the if if you had a there was a database of places uh, and it uh, sort of asking the machine to guess what kind of place it looks like you know uh, based on a whole set of place photos you know and identify it by different categories so these are actually all um, three three photos of the substation in the early 90s. You know, of course, you know, if you ask the question of a computer, what do you think an art space looks like? Or does this look like an art space? Or let it can guess what kind of space it is. And then it comes out of different predictions, like on the the, the first one, it, the, the gallery looks like a gallery, but the second one, it thought it was a TV studio. And last of all, the no, it thought it was a kitchenette. Actually, it's current office space. It looks a bit like that today. So, you know, the, of course, the substation is in a, is in a kitchenette. Um, um, but you know, I thinking about this, I always think of this idea of this semantic chaos. You know, where uh, you know the the kind of original thing it is and its digital translation don't actually ever kind of meet. Um, and when I kind of looked at this exhibition, I had to kind of design for the archive. You know, I thought of this fragments. You know, like almost as if an art exhibition was composed of all these separate fragments that work in that kind of like all these words in a sentence before they actually spoken and thus encoded into language, you know? So I had to treat it more like a, a matter of taking these notes of information and allowing the visitor to make the connection between these notes. So this is a picture of how it looked like at the kind of archive exhibition for the substation. And um, I think the kind of thing I've learned from working with these two really strange archives is that I guess the process of digitization, you know, or and digital archiving really has to become an everyday part of the production of art and design. You know, there's this um, net art diagram. You know, where does the where does the art happen? You know, uh, and and of course the updated version. You know, you say that wait, is that does the art happen there, or uh, does it does it happen here? Or you know, wait, this is a 3D printing disaster. Um, and you know, or does it happen where you know the machine that I've tasked with the role of cultural craftsmanship, you know, to let the machine philosophize on what, if you gave it a name, does it come up with the object? What object will it look like? You know, based on uh, if it studies the sum of all human knowledge and produces an object. You know, like uh, if I if I have this, this is one of the objects from the library of Palau Saigon, which um, was actually called Two Pink Fragments. You know, um, based I think it's. I think this is because there was a, if you if you look online if you look on ImageNet you look at uh, Google Images for two pink fragments there seems to be a pink graph that keeps coming up that looks like this so if it looks a bit like like that you know I mean or does the you know is it does it happen at this point where we you know kind of encode it into into knowledge this is two pink fragments you know um, and kind of bring it back to the uh, exhibition that the kind of the work that I have outside this is a uh, this is a picture of the Singapore River in 2010 that I took on the banks of it, and I expected there to be information in the signboard, but instead, what I found on the banks of the river was this plastic sheet with no info, and people were squeezing their rubbish into the hole in between, and they were cleaning it out, and then more people were stuffing more rubbish in as well, actually, over time. And, you know, um, so I, I was very curious why there was no information about the, the river, you know, at, at, at it, there. so it kind of inspired me to, to work on a project kind of mapping the things about the river, like information or stories about the river. So this is a drawing I made of the, the river. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's actually quite accurate to the location of roads. Um, however, what I wanted people to uh, kind of contribute, all these stories, they could contribute a real or fake story. I mean, well, I told them that you could, you could, you could actually uh, submit an imaginary memory. So even if it was a bit confabulated, you didn't have to tell me, you can just add it in. And, um, these are pictures of it. Um, it, was, uh, it was developed as a substation, actually, um, during their open call in 2010. And um, you know, they, they showed it at other places, like uh, Singapore Art Museum. So it was a quite a varied audience that came to see it. Uh, some years ago, the website looked a bit like this, actually. Um, but of course, the idea is that not only did I want to kind of collect all these stories, there were about 1,355 at this point, uh, out of which about 300 are foreign, so I can't actually transcribe them. But um, besides that, um, I ended up having, I ended up digitizing them, um, kind of converting it almost manually uh, of, to, to something that, uh, this is actually the, the, the back end of it, it's just uh, the, the GeoJSON file for uh, the map. Uh, that I, I'm, all, all, the, all the all data points and all the stories were converted into this data sheet, uh, kind of an idiosyncratic kind of data sheet, uh, replete with all its kind of uh, mistakes if, if pe that people have introduced into it. Uh, 
kind of the categories. So you you see like people's stories were like this. Um, yeah, laksa and kendo, returning after fifty years. You know, um, and you know converting it into a into a map, a digital map. Um, you know, so that in the end it's also kind of about this. Um, this data and also how we actually cons how how I mean for me as an artist it's also about this digitization how do I actually kind of interpret the analog into uh, into some into a, into a digital map form so this is actually this is actually the 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 map outside which you can come and see uh, later as well so I guess uh, this is um, hopefully I, I guess for for me to sum up as a as an artist I I think that the archival digital archival uh, is something that should have been worked into the kind of process for every artist since we live in a world that in which all technology is already part of everyday life. So thank you anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Our next speaker, uh, Simone, she's a lecturer at uh, Reinwart Academy. Yeah, and uh, she runs master classes on uh, with students as to what they need. So just now, before this, the, the the previous panel, we had this question, right? What do we need? What skills do we need? I think uh, her presentation covers some of that. Yeah. So I guess I'll sort of be wrapping up this uh, this conference as uh, the last speaker of the presentational panels. Uh, are you still up for one more, or <laughs> are we all down already? <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> so um, we've heard very well, very much already about digitization, about digital and cultural spaces. Um, so I'll try to reflect on some of the things we've heard today and yesterday. Uh, I'm, I'm actually wanting to talk to you about something different than you've heard, um, because I think we should actually take it to a next step, or what should have been the first step maybe, in how do we actually train our heritage professionals in being able to work with digital and to be able to work in this changing environment that we uh, now live in. Um, for those who, of you who don't, when I walk around, please don't think I'm nervous or scared. I really need to use the bathroom, so I, I have to <laughs> change from uh, <laughs> steps one and out. So sorry about that. Um, for those of you who don't know the Rhineward Academy, we are one of the seven faculties of the University of Arts in Amsterdam and we train um, young professional students into becoming uh, cultural heritage bachelors, which is a full-time four-year uh, degree program. Um, and those are the people who are actually ending up working in museums, galleries, archives and well, actually any uh, collection keeping institution for that matter. Um, next to the bachelor degree program, we have a international master degree program, uh, which takes one and a half years. And that's actually a program where we fly in um, the, 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 the people who already work in museums into becoming more um, educated on a, on a more theoretical level in museology. Um, we don't have that great building that you showed us, Fiona, this, uh, this morning. Uh, we do have the privilege to move to into the city centre of Amsterdam, so we are covered with all the big museums surrounding us. So we actually use a lot of their collections into educating our students. So we're very hands-on. We're um, Actually, we're the only um, uh, a study program in whole of Europe who has their way of working with uh, heritage, cultural heritage uh, for that matter. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you about today is the next generation, what we call Generation Z. I don't know if you know that term. Some people call it the digital generation, which are the, the kids who are now in primary school or some in, in the higher school. Um, but they are actually the ones who will be our future visitors or even our future colleagues. And this is the generation that is really different from, well, the ones we, we ourselves actually are. Uh, there's a huge disruption going on there. And I think we have to be prepared uh, not only into inviting them in our galleries, but also inviting them as our future new colleagues and know how to uh, deal with these changing roles we have. Today is about digital, so I'm skipping the, uh, sorry about that, uh, Jean, I'm skipping the 
um, the, the, the physical uh, media, but I always tell my students, please remember when you talk about media, any media, re the, the biggest medium of all is of course our museum, right? The museum itself is the medium. That's what we're good at. We've been done this for ages. We will keep doing that for ages. So please never forget that uh, when you talk about uh, digital. Uh, so, so you can see a lot of examples here. We have heard a lot of examples the last uh, two days. And I guess this is normal, right? Digital is normal. We have the fortune of a uh, minister in culture and education in the Netherlands who is actually in her 50s and she claims digital is normal. And I really like her for that because that's new. Um, digital is not new for, uh, for uh, well, not in my opinion. We, we know are the audio tours. We know uh, the media tours we have on smartphones. We know how to place collections online. We know when we enter a gallery, we see this display using a TV screen or touch screen for that matter. We know Pepper's Ghosts. We know the games we have in our installations. We know all that. We know virtual reality using Oculus Rifts or uh, having huge touch screen walls or touch tables for that matter. We know all this. So why, I ask you, why do we keep saying that when we work with digital, we're working with new media? I think that is crap. Digital is normal. So I want to make a statement with you all now. So from of now, we all agree that digital is normal. Okay? Is it okay with you guys? Good. So now that we've tackled this, we can go into what is, I assume the problem um, that we're f dealing with um, in the near future, which is um, that when you are working with digital, you're not really uh, fighting digital, you're actually fighting the social impact of digital. And this is the most important thing I tell my students, that when you want to work with digital or when you want to um, adapt digital in your museum, when you start working in the field, please be aware that it is not the digital itself, that it is the social impact of digital. And also this is not new, because we know this for ages. Like the technique as the Pepper's Ghost, which is actually centuries old already, or the VR, which Michael claimed in, uh, in his uh, keynote, is already from the 80s. So is the social impact. In 1962, it was Marshall McLuhan who wrote the first book about using media as an extension of men. So that is not new to us. Uh, Debbie, you just said so, that it's a tool, right? And you use it as an extension of what you do in your daily life. It's not new. It is about the impact that the tool has on what you do in your daily routines. And that is really something we should acknowledge as being a museum or any collection carrying um, institution. So it's about the new generation, Generation Z. They're kids and they are really different from what we are as a generation. Um, in the picture here you see my eldest son, he's seven. And um, well, the funny thing is he loves what he's doing in this picture. What he is doing is he's sitting on a chair in his pajamas early morning. He always gets up at six. I hate him for that, but anyway. Um, as he gets older, he takes the tablet and he sits on the chair and he starts watching YouTube. And particularly on YouTube, he watches this one guy who is a very famous vlogger in the Netherlands who plays a video game, who plays Minecraft. So he sits there, he can do this for hours if I don't stop him, and he sits there and he watches a YouTube video where this one guy is playing a game that he likes. <laughs> I sort of get that now, but if I tell my parents, they're like, oh my gosh, you have to, you have to re-educate that kid because this is going the wrong way. <laughs> this is the disruption right there. Because the people who are now working in our museums, and I, I'm definitely not offending you, I'm just Dutch, so I'm going to be direct. <laughs> but the, yeah. the, the people who are now working in our museums, they don't get this. Because we were not raised having a constant connection, having an, an, an overall own regulation of who I want to connect with on what time and in what, in what place that I feel like. 
When I was a kid, when I was seven and I wanted to play with my friends, I had to make an agreement with my mom that I would be home at 5.30. And if I wasn't home at 5.30, well, there would be a sort of a discussion or at least some questionnaire on why wasn't you, weren't you home at 5.30. If I tell this to this generation, they're like, what's the problem? You just send her a message. She knows that you're going to be late or she knows you're going to stay with your friends. And if, that, if I tell them, well, sorry, because I didn't have a phone back then, they're like, no way, that's crazy. How can you live without a phone, right? I mean, the, the, the previous uh, panel also said, we feel naked if we, when we forget our smartphone. We are almost immersed with it. This picture has been going viral for a few months in the Netherlands. You, you probably know it, of course, from the Rijks Museum. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, we laugh about it, but it, it, it was a pretty serious discussion going on there. Uh, so can I see hands, who of you, and be honest, please, who of you think, I? it's not, not very good what I see in this picture. Be honest, show me hands. Oh, so maybe half of you. Fair enough. Okay. So who of you is like, well, okay, that that could, well, maybe there's a story behind it, or maybe there's an, a good explanation why these seven girls are sitting in one of the most important museums in our country, looking at their phone, turning the back to what we think is the most important painting we have. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on that, but this was the most common reaction on this picture. But that, that was our generation claiming this as a reaction. I actually know what they're doing, and I'm not going to tell you. Um, why? Because truly, I don't give a peep about what they're doing. It doesn't matter what they're doing. There were some people actually who, who, who thought, well, let's make it a positive story. Maybe they just took a picture of the painting, they want to sit down, and they're sending it to their mom to show her how great the museum is and how they love it. <laughs> that could be a good explanation, right? And sure, maybe they, they're not doing it, I can assure you. They're actually, OK, I'm going to tell you. They actually are using the very good multimedia tour that the Rijks Museum offers to download on your own phone. Why am I showing you this and why do I always show this picture to my students? Because it doesn't matter what they're doing, it's just the fact that they are doing this what matters. The fact that this is a generation that comes into our museums with their smartphone, who are actually, they don't feel ashamed when sitting down on a bench, turning their back to the most important painting of the Netherlands and using their phone. This is just a generation issue going on here. This is our future visitor. Or even worse, if you might say so, this is our future colleague. <laughs> so you better be prepared because they are coming. I can assure you, <laughs> they are. So I guess we, we know, now know this Generation Z thing, right? This is a new um, generation coming up. And we have to deal with this. And at the Ryan Academy, we feel that um, when you're dealing with changing roles for museums, and we actually deliver the people who are working in those changing environments, we have to be ahead of the changes. So we're already thinking of, OK, what can we expect when we want to train or educate this generation? So how do we get there? Well, first, of course, what does learning in a digital world mean? I don't know about Singapore, other places in, in, um, in Asia for that matter, but you've probably heard of the 21st century skills. Do you? Well, I see some people not. Um, this picture is actually Dutch, so sorry for that. I tried to uh, translate it into English on the side for you. Um, so we have divided these 11 um, uh, um, like focus points on educating this generation, this new digital generation. Some of the ones that are sort of jumping out, like creative thinking, problem solving, um, media awareness, 
or social cultural skills. These are all skills that I never, I, I were never taught this in primary school, let alone high school. Um, this is actually what they are doing now in the Netherlands to educate these kids. Well, these were trying to, <laughs> they're not there yet. Um, what you notice maybe is that media is explicit in this, uh, in this um, sum up. And maybe if we try to combine these into more groups, because 11 is quite a lot to work with if you want to make a curriculum for students on, uh, on heritage, I, I came up with these five. So there's media science, media literacy, media awareness, media adaptation, and media education. So please try to remember these. We have these five sectors on how to educate kids, new generation, digital generation, when it involves media. On the other hand, we have, of course, learning in heritage, learning about heritage. If you want to be a heritage professional, if you want to work in a museum, you definitely need a specific education for that. And at the Rhinewood, we came up with this uh, set of skills that we use. Uh, we have three focus points on that, which, uh, to be honest, in Dutch, they sound a lot more sexy than <laughs> in English, so sorry for the translation, but it is selecting, cherishing, and sharing. We think all of the competences that you need for being able to work in heritage are actually melted down in these three, uh, three, three points. So how is that arranged? We have seven competences that we use for training our future colleagues. The first one you see in the middle, which is the heritage theory. We claim that no matter what you are doing in the museum, art gallery or archive or whatever, you have to need this common base on heritage theory, like the ethical uh, aspect or um, well, it's the theory base. Okay can make more of it uh, as it is. So everybody gets this. That's our first competence. Then we have a set of three competences that sort of define which area in uh, heritage you're gonna um, make your profession in. So the first, for example, is presentation and um, audience education. So if you wanna make exhibitions or you wanna be a uh, public guider or something like that, that that's the way you're gonna choose, that's the direction you're going to take. Of course, collection care, very important one as well. If you want to work in the archive itself or you want to be in preservation, conservation, this is what you choose. And we have a third one, which is management. And that's actually a new uh, defined uh, competence with us, so you can actually choose the direction of getting more into management and then you can think of marketing, entrepreneurship, uh, that sort of uh, stuff. So we have four competences uh, dealt with now, then we have three left. The fifth one, again, is one that we all need, no matter what job we're going to get in the museum, which is research and judgment. At the Rhinewood Academy, we think judgment is a really huge and important part of being, being able to work in heritage, because you, you have to have that sort of constant awareness of what you're doing, is it relevant, and to whom is this relevant that I am actually working on. And the last two, which are communication and um, professional or personal development, are more from a sort of individual point of view in how you're actually evolving yourself in this course. So I guess I've never explained what we do in three minutes before, so I hope you can uh, sort of remember what I just said, because what I want to do is try to sort of emerge these two uh, skill, skill, sets of skills into maybe find a way to uh, train those Generation Z kids who come to our uh, course in maybe five years from now. Uh, and it sort of uh, looks like this. Uh, so I guess the most common thing they all need to know, it's sort of like the, the heritage theory, is the literacy, the media literacy. No matter what you're going to do in this museum, you need to be able to read or write with digital. Um, then we have four left. 
the media adaptation, media science, media awareness, and media education. So what if I decide to end up working in presentation, which is a very fair communication uh, combined, then I think now media education will be your focus point. So from now on at the Ryman Academy, we can now in our classes that um, go or, or that handle like exhibitioning or uh, public services or uh, um, well any actually any communication form that we we provide to our audiences, we need to also acknowledge media education for that matter. If I were to work in collection care for information management, for example, or uh, work more on uh, the educational part from um, innovation and development of our personal or professional base, media science comes into action. If I were to go into management, I would be more about media adaptation. We, we, we were talking about honor just in the previous um, panel said, well, it's actually a problem that we have curators and they're not adapting those digital forms to the fully um, in, this, uh, in this stage. Um, so adaptation, I totally agree with her. Adaptation is a huge issue on that point. And the last thing, we, when we're into research and communication, of course, media awareness is a big part. Uh, yesterday we talked about the election, Trump and Facebook, and well, whether there is, is true news or not. Uh, so media awareness also is a very big issue. So then, and I have to share this with my colleagues, to be honest, when you put the tr three focus points of working for a new uh, heritage professionals, you have the selecting on the awareness and adaptation part, you have the sharing on education and awareness, and you have the cherishing on uh, especially media science. This is actually what I wanted to do, well, throw at you. <laughs> it worked. You're very silent and you're sort of like looking, okay. <laughs> so next step is, I hope that we can actually talk about this. I really want to know how you feel and if you see something going there or you maybe totally disagree on, I'm very open to all. Because I actually hope that, that there will be some format uh, ending for us to, to know how we can handle that generation that is coming. We, we don't, don't block it, don't deny it. We don't write coaches anymore. Uh, so don't be a coach because you'll end up in a museum on the wrong side, actually. So this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Simone. Amina, thank you for all the wonderful presentations we had for this panel. Uh, I think it's, um, it's been very enlightening for me. Uh, I've been working on this open web thing for the last decade or so. Uh, so we've been looking at standards, how to make things even from machine readable to human readable and how it should be more together, I suppose. You know, and all the way from, uh, and now when we talk about digital literacy education, um, what our government is doing is very comprehensive. There are many governments in the countries I go to that don't have that sort of resources or the sort of plan. So it's also very enlightening to see that we are, I think, at the forefront of that. And then uh, I think Jean tells us uh, very clearly that if you leave it to people at the top to make decisions, you end up with um, interesting ideas. <laughs> Th that's all I got out of it. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, the, the, main, the main thing I got out of this panel is that I, I think digital is, is really the new normal. You know, when, when I first joined, we had, uh, we started a department called New Media Department. You know, this was what, 10, 15 years ago, right? Yeah. And today it's still called New Media Department. It should not be new anymore. It should be something that we've been doing on. And then uh, I think Debbie brought up the fact that it isn't a direct translation of what is physical. Like if we've been doing this for 10 years, Going to digital doesn't mean just taking a digital photo of it. It means creating new skills, um, learning your craft. I mean, if you look at Debbie's work of all, all her artworks, it's amazing the detail and the craftsmanship that goes into every piece. 
You know, and I think if we want to talk about ourselves as digital storytellers, we need to have that kind of approach to craftsmanship. You know, that is not the same as a, no, you want to translate something physical to something digital, you just don't just take the same thing and put it online. You need to think about the digital experience. So we have a short time of uh, Q&A right now. And very quickly, we have one at the back. Uh, can we send the mic up there? Uh, please state your name, where you're from, and then, uh, and then we can continue. Hi, Anna from the Art Science Museum. Thank you so much for a riveting panel. I feel like we've all learned so much. It was really brilliant. Um, actually, picking up on uh, Simone's presentation, um, I actually have a question for Jenny. Um, it was really amazing to hear the work that you guys are doing with the Silver Generation. It's super important. But I just wonder, if we looked at those 21st century skills that Simone uh, presented in her, in her talk, um, only one of those skills was ICT skills, and the rest were skills like creative thinking, critical thinking, um, you know, awareness, ed 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 you know, sort of the ability to adapt. I just wonder what IMDA's current kind of position is about how, how we develop those skills in parallel with the more technological skills. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for your question. Um, okay, what I'd shared is just a portion of what IMDA does. Um, you are right that actually for my team and the digital inclusion team, um, we focus on just the fundamentals, um, on the really basic IT skills, but the other um, divisions in, in IMDA, which I didn't bring in with my presentation today, we would focus more on you know the critical thinking skills. Uh, in fact, we have a, a division called a digital literacy team in IMDA, which focus on some of these skills. So um, yeah, so it's, just not covered in my presentation today. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, actually, just to pick up on Honor's point, Simone, in your slide, I don't think the word creativity was in the final uh, kind of uh, assembly of, of things. And I, it was a question that, that really was in my mind because of uh, partly Debbie's talk, but uh, I think too, um, Jean, your work was very much so, sort of trying to push uh, back at things. And of course, it, the the Art Science Museum commissioned, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a creative exhibition, and that's its exhibit. Um, you know, it's it, it is a collaboration with an artist. So um, for me, which is a boundary that I think is a very interesting one to cross, that is, it's not just the museum sort of acquiring something, but actually act as the client, um, the commissioning client. And I don't think you had that term in there, but I'm wondering where, where it is. It might just be, you know, it wasn't on there as a word. So I'm wondering where yeah. it is in your assembly of, yeah. well, of in, in themes. The, the, the the, the, the flower that I, I showed you to call it a flower, that are actually the competences that are uh, named from my uh, my uh, academy, and we, same as media for that matter, that it wasn't in there as well because we think like creativity, media, the sort of uh, terms are actually needed for all whatever we do uh, working in in heritage. So whether we are be curating or making exhibitions or making educational programs for kids, we definitely need creativity for all of those issues. So that's, it is actually something that has our full attention. Just we don't name it that because it's not a separate goal uh, for education. No. But you're very, it's very true what you say. Yeah. And it was, so can I add to that? It's actually, oh, yeah. Um, it, it actually took me a few years in my own academy to have people not see digital or media as a, 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 a single pillar for, uh, but to have them see it as an embedded issue in all of the aspects that we do. So I guess it maybe takes a little more <laughs> to, to have it done yet, yeah. I'm going to sneak in a quick question I wrote down. So when we work in the museum or the culture space, 
a lot of the external perception is that this is a highbrow, right? Like an inaccessible, or in Singaporean terms, you call atas. You know, kind of a, a place. How do we change the perception? Because people are not coming in because they think that it, you know, it might cost too much money. I don't know. You know, you tell your children, don't touch that. It's too expensive. And, and so they kind of back off. How do we change that perception so that this is accessible to all? Uh, this is for anybody. Well, my, my first answer would be let them do it th themselves. Because it, now we live in this age of, uh, but somebody said, I'm sorry, I don't remember who, but we exactly co creation is a big issue now. And our audiences define uh, what they want us to do in facilitating them to enjoy heritage. So I guess maybe it, it is also up to them how to get these boundaries down. And maybe we should back off a little as museums. Maybe that's a bad thing if I say it here with all those heritage people. But I, that is what I believe. Maybe you know, give them a bigger word and bigger say in what we do. Yeah. Just to pick up the word facilitating, because I've always described myself as a facilitator of experience rather right. than to be the, the person who creates the word, say, come and exactly. see this word directly. Because exactly. yeah. it's more about that interaction as well and um, that point of what they understand from it, what people right. get from the artwork. Yeah. I, I, I'm always very troubled by this, uh, the idea of accessibility in museums. I. Out of the 99 museums that I go through, out, you know, 99 out of 100, I usually end up walking through it really quickly. Mm -hmm. Except this one. <laughs> Angelita here, yeah. <laughs> no, I do, I do, and I have a lot of problems with it. I don't know why. And maybe because I, I'm not highbrow enough, maybe I'm not lowbrow enough, maybe I have no brows, I don't know. But I just feel trouble when I go to museums. And you know, when, when we talk about it and we find all these ways to try and influence it, and I, I realized most people don't get it. Yeah, so the other day I was at this unnamed museum when a couple of kids were looking at this exhibit on World War II and about how we had the Sok Ching and how you know, in Sok Ching, a lot of people rounded down there, they were shot in the head and all that. And uh, there was a lot of good information. There was interactive panels, lots of videos and all that. And then you know what they did? This is really heartbreaking. The three kids were discussing uh, the mechanical part of how the people were killed. So that, no, 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 I think they pushed them down and they were in blue pinafores. Uh, pushed them down and then they shot them in the head. No, 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 no. They stood them there, they shot them, then they fell into the pit. Yeah, eventually they all died and they were in the pit. That was quite scary. And I thought, oh my God, I don't think that's the way. I don't know what's the technique. I don't know whether it's co-creation or anything, but that can't be the way. And I don't know whether is spoon feeding them too much? Mm -hmm. But I would love to walk them into a Sok Ching exhibit where they realize the horrors of it. And hopefully it comes in M18, but even though they're 16, we'll still push them in. <laughs> and it, it would be like that, because then I would believe it. So I don't know whether, I don't know what the technique is, and I'm still trying to perfect it. But it's like Westworld, you know? Watching Westworld, you believe in artificial intelligence. And I, I would like to walk into a museum where I believe that, I believe what I'm experiencing. And to me, I don't know, it means a heavy hand. I'm a, I'm, the, I'm a huge proponent of heavy hand curating because if it gives them that feeling that they were right there, then heavy hand away. Right. Yeah, just, just you know, literally screw it, you know, just do that, yeah. <laughs> You know, I was just thinking, I mean, uh, how using technology to bring them in, to lure them in, um, you know, how, how, like, for example, you know, I look at all these travel documentaries and I look at how beautiful some places are and I tell myself, I have to go there, right? And now with technology and how they can see so much and I've been looking at your Google Culture Institute and all the great things that they've, they've done to, to bring these artifacts to... Um, to me at my home or wherever I am and to, to tell me how beautiful these things are. I mean, if we can just show them to that, I mean, and, and you know, you can bring these things to the people and, and invite them in. I mean, I'm not sure whether, you know, that might be a way to, to lure the people on the streets into the museums. That's a, that's a thought, yeah. 
I'm going to jump in and weigh a little bit on that. Uh, what we notice about the browsing patterns of the new generation is that they no longer go to websites. Remember our time you used to go, you had your favorite website, right? But these days, they don't look at websites anymore. They look at articles. And so in the same way, well, we, we try to bring people to a museum, which is like a website. People don't subscribe to the whole museum. They subscribe to an individual story. So they're actually looking for one story, a good story. It doesn't matter where it comes from, and the next story, and the next story after that. So digital lends itself very well to this kind of storytelling. If you have a good story, put it up there. It'll be on top of the feed, and then they'll get to it. But uh, come, going back to you guys, yeah, you have any other questions you want to quickly raise your hand while we have a little bit of time left? Dying for the tea break? <laughs> okay. Well, I am, but... <laughs> yeah, she, she needs to use the bathroom, remember? <laughs> we're, we're holding the back. Okay, if there's nothing else, then uh, thanks to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time.